Hello and good evening, everybody. I would welcome you to our lecture by Marinella Senatore from the School of Narrative Dance, the Alliance of Bodies and Relation to Others. And I am welcoming you here from the Badische Kunstverein, where our program series, How Do We Care, is taking place. We started in October here with a program series of workshops, performances, lectures, screenings, and now switched all the program to digital. And I'm really welcoming and saying thank you to Marinella Senatore, who is joining us tonight for her lecture online. Thank you very much. I'm also welcoming Mira Hirz, who is one of the co-curators of the program series in exhibition here in Badischer Kunstverein. And I'm really happy that we have it here tonight. Um, we will have this lecture by Marinella and we will have this talk for around an hour, then going into a small break. And after this, um, Mira is going to moderate a small Q&A. This is our plan for tonight. And I'm very happy that we have Marinella Senatore here, who is a multidisciplinary artist. Her practice is characterized by participation and dialogue between different formats like history, popular culture, and social structure, structures. She studied at the Academy of Fine Arts in Naples, at the Conservatory of Music, and on the National School of Cinema in Rome. And her work now is dedicated to visual arts working with a very wide range of different media like photography, video, sculpture, installation, painting, drawings, and collage. And tonight she will tell us about the School of Narrative Dance, which she founded in 2012. And it's a nomadic school which is free of charge and settling in different places. And gets into different forms. And yeah, Marinella will give us an insight tonight into her work with the school. And we are really looking forward to it. So I don't want to lose any more words and will give the speech to Marinella Senatore. Thank you very much, Yvonne, Mira. Thank you everybody for attending and having me this evening with you. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk about the School of Narrative Dance, even more in such difficult times where we are re-questioning a lot of uh, instance about uh, community-based uh, project and uh, social engaged project, and in general also the movement itself. Uh, as you said, my background is pretty multifaceted. I come from so many different different. Uh, uh, languages, uh, among them the classical music and uh, the movie, and both the orchestra and the movie set were extremely important for me to let me understand the way I wanted to work. This choral structure of uh, shared creativity was always in the back of my mind. And then what I simply tried with the artistic processes was to include all these experiences and the structures of work into my artwork, actually. Uh, I uh, founded in 2012 the School of Narrative Dance after so many choral projects that I did, uh, which had the final restitution as movie or other times as installation or whatever. Actually, it's not exactly the final restitution that led, led me to uh, to the movement and choreography, but was another experience, another language that I I had uh, in that moment in mind. And for me, it was very inter interesting and intriguing to work on something that people were demanding so much. I always worked on a base, uh, participatory base, uh, and wherever I go, I try to instigate and activate processes. And after a uh, bunch of project with so many people, I realized that no verbal language, not the dance intended as athletic gesture, but in general, the no verbal language and the movement and the political meaning of the body itself were all instances that people had very clear in mind and they wanted very much work on that. And me too, actually. So uh, 
on the other hand, I also realized during the practice until 2012 that uh, these groups I left, uh, of course, uh, when I work, I uh, live a long time with the communities that I meet and I assume the role of the activator of a lot of processes within the groups that we are forming. But the moment where I left was always pretty dramatic and because it, it was based, everything we did was based really on a relation and the sharing of time and very sensitive topics, uh, by the way. So I felt, and I still feel that the, the need that at least to me participants showed up was always being part of something, feel included in something. And the school of narrative dance seemed to me like a sort of container and a big umbrella under which I could uh, move even more project, but let people feeling part of something. Maybe we can uh, show some pictures to our public. So, because sometimes pictures speak more than uh, words in this case, we are talking about millions of people. So it's particularly interesting for me to show these people, maybe not all of them, because we recounted that uh, with the School of Narrative Dance, we worked with over 6 million of people so far, which is great. It's equally great to work with 20 or 10, but of course it's fantastic to know that there are so many people asking to be an active part of an artistic process. And, um, and uh, approaching over 6 million of people all around the world, so very different groups, at, uh, not only based on, uh, um, actually, almost never uh, uh, um, related to each other by a big interest in art, rather a big interest in making something together with other people. This is what I feel. Actually, our participants are very rarely people connected to our system or um, expertise or even other artists. So it's, it's pretty moving to see how a very contemporary language can speak to so many people so different and creating a temporary community, not necessarily based on geographical uh, areas or ethnicity, but even just connected by a wish. And the School of Narrative Dance offered so many experiences and dance arrives at a very late stage of our process. So I would like while we show more picture and we can show randomly, so just to have an idea of how many participants and how we also dialoguing with this uh, with the people uh, also object based uh, artworks that uh, are the results of a lot of processes that we do indeed but i assume that the the school of narrative dance you very well know uh, for its performative appearance but rather to call it just a performance i prefer the terms act action in the urban environment because actually it's always the final restitution and action that we do activating the city uh, itself uh, so outside people that live there energies that maybe are even unknown to other people can be activated this is a, very much about emancipation of people also emancipated uh, in terms of who is the author. Uh, I don't need as artist to be always present and always recognized as the author of the project. I like the idea of share uh, contents and the new narrative that can create it when I withdraw even my presence. Now, for instance, we are, uh, we are uh, watching something about manifesta uh, in Palermo and the gathering of people that we created in that occasion was really the response to an instance that I felt very urgent from the citizens and such multifaceted uh, 
communities, uh, languages, religion, uh, ideas. So everything was uh, addressed in something that at the end is a celebration of the people. And that's also why it happens in the street. And very often it takes the forms of a big parade or a big procession. But taking a step back, I would like to describe the, the process itself. So how it starts a school of narrative dance project. And then maybe we get into what is narration and what does it mean in terms of uh, choreography and dance, because obviously there is dance at a certain point, but I always declare that languages for me are just tools and these tools uh, let me activate something else, something that I'm convinced is it already exists, but I want to make visible or even get surprised by, by uh, how many realities that even the, the same citizens don't know and can pop up incredibly freely. So usually, uh, I'm a multidisciplinary artist, so I don't work only with uh, performative events, etc. But definitely, I work on, always on participation as topic and also as structure of working. And participation doesn't mean for me necessarily interaction, but definitely the School of Narrative Dance is the project where most interaction and co-creation happens. And usually we are, we are nomadic, of course, so we don't have a building uh, and it's obviously important for me to don't. So uh, we can travel around the world and we can uh, change the methodology and uh, expectation and way to proceed depending on the people. People lead the project in a lot of senses and also in the way I personally work. Nevertheless, I have two or three points, let's say, in these structures. And we are usually uh, invited by institution because we need a physical space. And I install the school in the form of installation, sometimes in the museum uh, when it comes uh, at museum, but always asking the museum to change a bit their protocol to challenge a bit also their own structures and maybe allow the School of Narrative Dance to work and be activated during the time of the opening, uh, the opening time of the institution itself, for instance, a museum. You no, know, I think about, uh, I don't know, Centre Pompidou or uh, Queen's Museum or Martin Museum in Rome. So very big museum that have their own protocols, their own strategy of creation and uh, their structures, of, obviously. And I ask them to stretch it a bit and allow uh, the audience of the museum itself to uh, take a look at the school and early dance while it's happening. This is pretty important for me, not only because we can reach more audience and we can also work with people that maybe at the beginning uh, didn't understand very much about the project or were completely uh, uh, uninterested in the project but also to uh, make visible a lot of um, people, groups, and uh, entire communities within the, a community that otherwise are pretty invisible and even at, at, uh, to the, their neighbors. Uh, so yeah. We start mapping the field and of course I'm not somebody who like to arrive in a place and uh, assuming in a very abusive role or thinking uh, how things should be or demanding uh, people to do something this or that in my opinion this is exactly the opposite of wo what a participatory based project should be uh, if my role is abusive if i control every step and i just fulfill my own expectation which means my pre-existent expectation, no matter who I have in front of me, this is a very unsafe. And uh, if I can be more honest, 
I would say also pretty dangerous to a lot of art in the public sphere that claims to be uh, socially engaged, participatory based, etc. I'm pretty uh, critical uh, about this kind of uh, procedure. I like the idea to foster something, to activate something, something that possibly I don't even know that exists and I will discover together with other people. Um, that's why even the project can last for months, sometimes one, sometimes six, seven, even one year in certain rare cases. In general, I try to have a team which is smaller possible in order to engage local people to jump into the School of Narrative Dance container and even work as a producer and uh, for the organization, I mean. In this way, local people can open up the community to somebody who doesn't live there and doesn't know a lot of things. And instead of reading about the places or studying on my own, I try to interview uh, meet as much as people possible, uh, which obviously changes every time, but people from very different uh, spaces, organization and uh, groups that can highlight me something that is relevant for them or deserve to be told in their opinion. This is, for example, something that we did in Germany in Berlin, what we are watching right now. And I, it's super multicultural group of professional dancers that don't leave making their own job in Berlin, but they try to make a life there. And I was extremely blessed to discover all these energies. And this would be possible without local people that try to activate the resources of their own community. Um, yeah, so after this big time, actually the big, the biggest part of the project is done by researches, uh, meeting, scout visit, m myself living in this place as much as possible, uh, accordingly with um, all the other things that I have to do, but definitely to have a personal contact with members of the community and also understanding where somebody who is not very much visible in the community could be uh, gathered or where a lot of people not associated or uh, that don't belong to any specific groups could, be, could feel asked. Uh, so I start after all these researches and the meetings and the dialogues and discussions and uh, briefing, I start a process of open call. And this open call is really, really, really open, which means that literally everybody is uh, welcome, no matter the competencies, no matter the previous experiences, no matter even physical and mentally disease they may have, uh, because what we try to do is to narrate and celebrate community and empower people uh, which cannot exclude anything. And uh, if I have to work uh, with different languages, for instance, sign language, as it happened very often, or uh, with mental disability or whatever other uh, challenge we can face as team, we must learn. It's the opposite way, not the others that then to be accommodating towards us, but the way opposite. We must learn something new and we must find the resources, also the human resources, uh, in order to proceed and make this project really available. Sustainability and openness of the, the project for me are very, very important. So this open call can work in so many different ways. The first one is to connect with the people already in uh, touch with the, with the institutions, university, museums, foundations that are hosting us. Because, of course, these are already energies and groups that can open up to other groups and create a very nice uh, network. And this net is super, super uh, efficient. 
then from there we start opening up and using uh, tools that we can uh, find in the location for instance sometimes it's the case of local radios other times uh, free press i like pretty much free press as a way to communicate with people uh, direct letter of invitation when it comes to my research and i learn that there is this group or another group so i try even to get uh, for people to feel asked, because this is also important, which uh, implicitly uh, requires that I also translate in all the languages spoken in the city or in the little town where I'm, small town where I'm working, that I have very clear in mind all the uh, minorities and uh, ethnic minorities that I, I can uh, I can meet and how to reach them. Um, and then there is also a very super easy, in my opinion, way to communicate, which is made by leaflet uh, that I can leave uh, uh, in uh, strategic places that sometimes can be even just a train station or something where homeless can sleep or somewhere uh, libraries or, or other crucial places where I imagine uh, together with the local people that uh, we could reach out more and more people because this is a very interesting part of the project. Uh, usually people think in the final restitution or in the project uh, um, when it starts with the workshops, rehearsal, etc. But actually for me, the open call is the most important part because in that moment, I make people feel asked. And then it's secondary, how many people will join and how many people would like to, would like to share and challenge themselves or find um, a place in the project for them, which of course we negotiate and we talk a lot about. But first and most important is to ask people and to feel them ask it in their own languages or with through their own system of communication, which doesn't mean social network and full stop. Actually, usually social networks don't work at all for my project, I don't know why. Um, but yeah, definitely is this phase the most sensitive? And, and then we will work with what we have. Um, and if I look back at, at the past and I see how many millions of people gather, maybe this lack of, feeling asked or included really in a project or that what we claim as participatory art is ignoring them uh, is something very significant and i try to keep this in mind for sure i, I fail and i'm sure i fail it but i want to improve in this aspect more and more and and uh, usually people remember my project for the big scale or the big numbers, two millions of people, uh, 1,000 of people here, 2,000, 5,000 people like there, as they were like a sort of a mass, while my practice is all focused on the individual and the individual and the individuality within a choir, a sort of choral uh, structural work it's what defines, in my opinion, the good participation. Uh, I must learn the name of the people I work with. And at least one time, especially when it comes to huge numbers, at least one time, I have to try to speak directly to them. Uh, these are my fixed points, let's say. So that there are fixed things that I don't want to change. And of course, this is extremely time consuming and I, I'm not going to hide that it's very stressful as well, but nobody asked me to make this work. <laughs> I, I decided to do and I want to do in a certain way. Well, after that, we have already uh, engaged uh, people in the community, the local uh, the local managers, the liaison with the community, etc., the radios, the, the media, made by citizens themselves at the end. No? So we already have engaged all the community that 
go around the, the institution who invited us, and then we can definitely start to uh, welcome all the other people that will decide at least to take a look, at least to join the first meeting. Accordingly, with their um, uh, availability, and of course, we must be in this moment very good in organization, uh, we uh, fix uh, big meetings and before COVID times, it was extremely easy to make this in a big theater or football uh, <laughs> uh, camp or, or other big, big auditorium in museum, etc. Now this is gonna happen on digital platform, but honestly, it's not the first time and it's not because COVID, coronavirus, uh, it's very tragic pandemic, but it's also highlighting a lot of things that are already within a community. And for instance, all this need to feel uh, together, as Bauman said, and we are watching now, the word community feels good. And this is exactly what a lot of people think, the loneliness and the lack of belonging are addressed to me and my uh, collaborators on a daily basis by a lot of participants. And when somebody asking me, do you find something in common among all these people around the world? No, not really, actually. Uh, imagination, imaginary is completely different. Wishes, frustration are pretty different. The way to communicate or to get engaged can be very, very different. But this lack of belonging is always there. And it's always very, very clear. And it's about energy at the end. And uh, I'm very good uh, in activating the energy of the others, maybe more than mine. I, I'm very good in this. And I like this role. For me, I like very much this role. Uh, I feel good in something in life. And it's activating an energy that I feel is there. Um, activating an energy means making feel free people also to fail. And I guess that the creative project can be the best in terms of how to feel comfortable in your own skin. And sometimes we learn that skin is a statement, by the way. And it's comfortable to fight and to have conflict and resolve them making the project. Actually, we are not in a safe place where everybody loves each other. There are people so different in every project uh, that they come from completely different community with absolutely different modes of behaving and uh, communicating each other, also with ritual and things that are not possible or uh, unacceptable sometimes. So obviously there are a lot of conflicts, obviously, but making participatory projects doesn't mean to me that we have to pretend that the conflicts are not there. The great thing is that we can sort them in a very calm and creative way. Uh, and, and now I will explain why, because uh, before to talk with the, to speak with the, um, to the others with the body, we pass through the narration, the verbal narration, I mean. So we organize the first initial workshops where we meet people. I personally meet people. I think it's very important for people to understand who is behind the project and who is this artist? Is there asking them to even make something completely new for the very first time in their life and why? they can use this project. And the idea that art can be useful for me is great. Uh, I don't find this a, in a negative way, just the opposite. I adore the idea that I can be useful and the project that I concert can be useful, that in general, contemporary art can be useful. Well, uh, art in general, at least for me, it was and it is very useful. So mapping the field, will we, jump into, like you are watching now, incredible um, traditional <laughs> uh, culture.
that is very dear to certain people, not only all the people, actually. And then mapping the field and taking uh, uh, the dialogue with the possible groups, we start thinking about what is there, what they would like to highlight. I describe a, a bit how is the school of narrative dance, what we have done in the past, and definitely what we can do together, but it's just uh, impromptu. And then what I say, it's in the hand of the others that can be really highlighted and raise and create something new. So popular culture, vernacular gesture and languages and uh, performing uh, uh, um, languages, spoken words, uh, activism, whatever in the place people highlight to us, these are potential um, disciplines that we will study during the workshop. So the movement and the dance is not the, the only uh, language at all. So for instance, here we are in uh, Bregenz and uh, uh, we, we met a lot of uh, people extremely uh, aficionated to uh, uh, popular culture and rituals and costume, etc. And they had a voice, they had a big voice into the project. So the workshop are organized uh, on a daily basis when it's possible and uh, they jump from literature to activism, from carpentry to dance in every aspect and in every style you can imagine, or parkour or cramp or urban dances or urban uh, cultures in general. Our professors for one day are always local people, always, and they come from the very different background, from unemployed to refugees, from scholars to uh, artisans. Uh, who wants to share something is potentially, and if feasible, a professor of the School of Narrative Dance. So they can activate their uh, own uh, neighbors and all the people that they don't know at all, that they never met, but they are the, their own, um, uh, they, they share the same cities, the same jobs, or who, who knows, so uh, the connection can be millions. So um, these workshops are extremely productive because people start sharing. We, we make a lot of reading and uh, collective reading and writing sessions. So we work a lot on literature, on things, and every step of the school it's completely different from another because the local energies change and because the disciplines can be so many. Um, maybe we can go with the picture a bit uh, uh, faster. Thank you. Uh, as you see, sometimes I, I, I also draw the participants or the activities that we make together. I have a huge archive. Uh, made by contribution all around the world and the things that people decide to share and I have so many ways to to uh, remember them um, okay so uh, um, uh, all these narration that they share are then uh, um, absorbed by the body and together with the, very special uh, choreographers. Uh, I have several around the world and I still opening to a lot more because every choreographer would like to be part of the School of Narrative Dance can, uh, can reach me out and we can discuss because I want to keep the School of Narrative Dance as a very big container and a lot of different experience with the body can be super exciting and super interesting. So it's a never ending project also in this sense. But let's say that together with all this uh, professor we find uh, in, uh, uh, in the different places where we are working, then we also uh, organize a workshop that comes to the final part of our activities with the choreographers. 
uh, pedagogist of the dance, uh, people that work a lot on movement and the political um, importance of the movement and the body itself. And we start working basing on what people already do. It's very interesting for us to don't arrive in a place with pre-existent ideas. And it's equally important for me that we don't arrive to any place in any place with the pre-existent choreography but we live the same experience that our participants are living. We share the same workshop, we create the same uh, collaborative experience, and then we realize how our bodies are moving, how their bodies are moving, how they are describing already their life at themselves, and we start from there. So everything we do is based on a very comfortable situation of movement, and it's not focused on being the choreography of the year, <laughs> or actually it's very rare that we work with the professional dancer. And if we do, they are willing to make a completely new experience and not based on uh, 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 how beautiful performance they can make in a theater because they don't need me to do that and they don't need the school of narrative dance, but they can share unbelievable moments and experience uh, made by emancipation and empowering with the big communities that possibly they never met. And our participants are extremely intriguing and not embarrassed at all to see bodies that move in a certain way and bodies that are also trained in a certain way. And they just enjoy, they don't find themselves frustrated because of that. They have their own possibility within their bodies. And finally, I will describe the final restitution, which is important. It's part of the process. I guess the entire artworks starts <laughs> from the beginning of the conceiving, but definitely the final restitution is a sort of uh, monument to people. Uh, it's about the dignity of the participants. It's a shared memory that uh, will be with us forever. And it's also the restitution uh, to the other people, to their families, their friends, their relatives, about their uh, efforts and they need to others to look at them. So we uh, create um, sort of a route in the cities, we uh, work permanently. Maybe we can jump to pictures that show people in the street, uh, photographs, I mean, if we have in our selection, thank you. Now, maybe I will show you also uh, uh, brief videos. Great, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yvonne. So, uh, why in the city? Why not in the museum? Why not in another way? Because the political meaning of taking the street, it's everything. And it's the natural uh, outcome of the school of narrative dance. It never happened that people asked me to do in a theater or to do in a different place. They are not interested in performing perfectly and having an audience applauding them. They don't look at this as I don't do actually, but we are rather far interested in rewrite our presence, even physical presence in the street, in the street that is there their city or their place where they live, where they possibly uh, walk every day, but with another role. Maybe this is the case when the roles are uh, not so important. And, and this way to peacefully take the street and show up and having the courage to uh, find yourself empowered uh, it's extremely important also for the audience that is not participating in, in, the, in the project. And so often we had then the activation of people in the audience uh, that without any uh, fear to jump or not, to join or not in something that at the end they didn't work with us, 
very often they decide to get in not exactly what they know what they will do in Nader because it's the first time that they meet audience as well but I never never uh, stopped a situation like that I remember when it came to manifesta or now that we are watching picture about uh, the school of narrative dance in Cold Spring in New York State hundreds of people jumped into the performance into the action the urban action that we staged because of course we stage then how we move and how we will we will make our uh, uh, our um, our things in the street well i embrace that and so my participants do um as you see languages we, that we can use belong to people so there are people that teach us how to stay with the body. You can imagine the situation, the chaos, the sound, the music, the melting, the, the, the mix of the flow of energy and the shout and screaming, everything. And there are people that can meditate and, uh, and engage mindfulness in the project. So this is pretty, uh, uh, it's, it's pretty encouraging for me. And then uh, um, we uh, used to show and create this chaotic uh, uh, route, uh, mixing a lot of different elements, such as music, uh, spoken words, uh, sounds, um, singing uh, and movement as in every declination possible from parkour to uh, meditation, passing through all the style uh, imaginable of dance, uh, classical, uh, modern and uh, extremely contemporary or even meditative. There are also sports and all the approach possible, having a very clear in mind that we we're in contact with so many instances and so many topics and we learn so much that it's obvious that all these things must take place that's why at the end the performances or the actions as i prefer to call them of the school of narrative dance uh, were established as a sort of parade or procession uh, through the streets and I would like to make the difference between the two things. Uh, procession comes from a religious um, uh, uh, heritage uh, because we are used, especially in the south of the world and the more, more Catholic countries to celebrate, like Italy, to celebrate the saint and make this long procession uh, to the street, uh, bringing this, the sculpture of the, the the saint, but this kind of celebration and rituals uh, can be also uh, uh, found in every kind of uh, uh, rebellion, resistance, manifestation in the street um, during the strike or uh, resistance or, or gathering of people uh, in demonstration. Um, as well as the power, the big uh, hegemonies, uh, even the dictatorship that show the, the power to people through a uh, long parade uh, when they show up, uh, sometimes even the militaristic uh, futures. Um, yeah, so in the history and in the rituals of humans, from a political carnival uh, from South America to uh, worker unions uh, strikes or religious ceremonies, we can find this structure of parade and procession with the difference that in the case of the parade, the procession, we have also these stops. So places where we keep marching and other places and moments along the path where we are static and we enjoy something that is happening and then we go on. 
last thing that I would like to say uh, uh, before to maybe show a very, very short video is the energy and the short circuit that is generated by the overlapping and mixing of very different elements that are already present in the city and then maybe we mix uh, or maybe we are too crazy to mix, uh, which are extremely different uh, languages and they, their combination as the combination of so many different humans can generate a huge flow of energy. That's why very dissonant language sometimes can happen at the same time, like uh, very electronic uh, music with, I don't know, uh, a, a cappella, uh, a, a, not a cappella, sorry, um, a, um, meditation or something extremely energetic paired with the parkour or classical music paired with uh, uh, the most uh, uh, strange uh, uh, language as, uh, I don't know, spoken words and activists with the tap dance. And uh, one language uh, supports the other and highlight the, uh, the other. So, and again, they are possibility for expression, but they are not our final goal. Our final goal is definitely the incredibly huge energy that is generated by this process of dissonance and connection. So maybe we can send, we can show Yvonne the, um, uh, the um, uh, School of Narrative Dance uh, Ecuador, please, where we can uh, give an insight into one of the projects that we made in the Ecuador and how um, uh, People were, oh no, Rosa's Parade Berlin, maybe it's, oh, okay, okay. I hear, but I don't watch, maybe it's just me. Okay, maybe we can send it. It didn't work, right? Yeah, no, it didn't. Okay. Or at least I didn't see it. Then give it another try. Okay, or switch to uh, Berlin or whatever. Maybe it's this video, I don't know. Which would you would you like to show? The Ecuador or Equ Ecuador, Ecuador, uh, if it works, that would be great. Let's see. Yeah, yeah, super. super.
sorry. <laughs> I was standing in there. We can skip to the very end, please. Just uh, 20 seconds before the end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yvonne. Now, if it's possible, please let's play Rosa's trailer. And Rosa's trailer is not the School of Narrative Dance project, but it was the project that we did prior to the foundation of the school. And it explains a lot the way we engage communities. Uh, trailer Rosa's, please. Thank you. We don't visualize the screen and then if you can switch it to Rosas, please. Trailer Rosas. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. But we listen and we don't see the picture. No picture. Uh, yeah, super. Unbeknownst to her, really, at that point, she finds herself around about the city centre. get involved in script writing as well. It's not a provoking question, a controversial question. Um, I want to be a film director. Wow. Thank you very much, Yvonne. Just a few words about the videos that we already watched. I decided to show a, a short part of uh, the School of Narrative Dance Ecuador because it was exactly one of the very few projects we did partially indoor using the, shooting uh, the video uh, within the premises of the um, of the Biennale in that case, because it was in Cuenca, in the city of Cuenca in Ecuador. 
and it was pretty special as project because we had as a participants only and exclusively activists and the dancers. It was the first and the last time that we had such a homogenic um, uh, group and with so specific uh, aims. And for them, it was politically very significant to perform into the buildings and include also the marching uh, band that you saw, uh, which are uh, not so easy to work with. And usually they don't get out from their schools and it's extremely uh, tough and rigid the way they receive education. So it was from the part of the activists an idea to engage them and make them feel a part of the urban tissue. And uh, for Rosas, I wanted to show you that because Rosas uh, was exactly the project uh, made me realize that I needed to create a more specific container for such experiences. And uh, just after a few months uh, from the end of the project, uh, Rosas, I decided to found the School of Narrative Dance. Um, but Rosas, it's very uh, explicit in the way it shows how local energies were included into the project. In that case, it wasn't based on dance, it was, it was based on uh, the possibility to make a move, uh, an opera for the screen in three chapter. Uh, the first one was conceived and produced in Berlin. The second one in uh, UK, in a city, uh, a small city near London uh, uh, called Derby. And the third one was made in Madrid. The peculiarity of the project, beside the fact that we had 20,000 participants in the three countries, so it was a huge effort of just making them communicate in their languages, including the sign languages. We had over 1,000 deaf people, uh, which is great because I'm very happy that uh, 1,000 and more, even more actually, uh, people found the, um, a place in this project. Um, it was very peculiar because with the uh, uh, few, very few money actually, not very much, from these the three institutions that produced the project, I uh, decided to use this money making people traveling from one country to another. And uh, of course, not all of them, but the, the participants engage in the writing the movie, which were uh, basically um, all illiterate or majority of them were illiterate. And uh, especially the German, uh, Chap there was very fortunate, very beautiful, and and it's still a reference for a lot of people, and it, it it's it's a way for me to describe also the the way we relate then as team and me as artist to the population and how we stay in contact after Rosas we. Uh, switched to the school of narrative dance in a certain way in order to create a container because so many people wanted to stay in touch among them and with me but obviously more among them and they they wanted to something and they create an association called rosas just because the project uh, fostered this encounter no, of people and uh, this sharing of energy and the uh, derby in uh, uk is a very small city it's not big as berlin and as madrid and even there the people don't didn't know each other or if they knew uh, it was very superficial or they judged them uh, each other on a, on basing on uh, uh, the level of job uh, the the social class or the uh, things that now they don't have absolutely importance. Um, and of course, it was pretty dramatic when it came uh, uh, to work with uh, 1000 deaf people because the no deaf people asked me and wondered how they could have made it possible. And we did because uh, 
this kind of project must be flexible and must be open and necessarily uh, ready to change completely their own structures. So I think I, I talk a lot actually. So uh, if you like Yvonne and Mira, we could call for this break uh, for people to rest a moment and maybe start the Q&A session. What do you think? Yes, thank you very much, Marinella. It was so okay. interesting listening to you and about your work of the School of Narrative Dance. Yes, as Marinella just said, um, we would like to start after a short uh, break with a Q&A session. And I just will introduce shortly into it. So we have in the webinar the function of raising your hand. It's in the lower bar of your um, Zoom account. And if you raise your hand, if you have a question, we can allow you to speak and you can bring in your question um, by saying, or otherwise uh, you can also click on the Q&A button and then you can type in your question. Um, sometimes the speaking option doesn't work if you're using an older browser or maybe also if you're using the Safari browser. So we will then look at it and you can also write in your question and the Q&A part. Then uh, we'll be then right back in five minutes with Mira and Marinella for the Q&A round. See you soon.